Well, thank you, Jeffrey and Bob, for leading us in those really important acts of remembrance. And it is good, isn't it, to gather together to worship, to stop, to remind ourselves of how Jesus died for each and every one of us. Thank you both. Uh, thank you also to you for your prayers this week. A uh, few of us have been out in Utrecht, so Hazel and I travel back on Thursday. And then Walter, Anne, Dave and Lynn are having a little bit of an extended time out there. And they are flying back tomorrow. You know, some of you are dreadfully concerned that Hazel and I were not going to navigate our way there and back. <laughs> but it has been a brilliant few days and it has just been really wonderful just to gather together and spend time with others from different regions beyond churches. And we were really blessed with some great worship, some thought-provoking teaching, just brilliant to pray together, just to share conversation and fellowship with others. Uh, you may remember Alan, who came over in February. I know it's February because that is still my PB on part run. I was adamant I was going to try and keep up with him. I realised in about the first 30 seconds that there was no chance. Yeah, so February he was here and uh, he's involved in Hope Church over in Utrecht and he set up a little Regions Beyond Runners group whilst we were out there, so that was great. Had a lovely run around a, a lake and a forest, at least I think the view was good, couldn't see a thing, it was quite dark at that time in the morning and the trails were really narrow so I was trying not to fall into the water. Um, but it's just so flat, if you've never been over to the Netherlands, just everywhere is really, really flat. I went running with my brother yesterday to St. Rebels. That was not flat, so uh, <laughs> all was good. I, I've never seen so many bikes being ridden either as over there. They are king of the road. And they really do stop for nothing. They stop for no one. And uh, my Dutch is non-existent, but the one afternoon Anne and I were walking back to the hotel and I'm fairly sure that I was right with my translation, that it was, get out of my way, was shouted to her. Uh, but it was a, a great time, and, and for me personally, just the time spent over there was definitely a much-needed time of encouragement and challenge. And uh, as I said, Walter is uh, staying over in Utrecht for a couple of days, and he'd asked me to sort this morning out, and I'd got the bones of a message prepared, ready to share today, and I thought, well, I'll just pray about it, think about it whilst I'm over there, put the finishing touches to it over the weekend. But whilst I was out there, the Holy Spirit clearly prompted me that wasn't actually the message to bring this morning. So one has been prepared instead, uh, been prompted to share on worship this morning. So we got there on Tuesday, and our first gathering together on the Tuesday began with a time of worship. It was a bit of a last minute swap. The person who was leading worship didn't quite factor in the time difference, I don't think, for an hour ahead. So they didn't quite make the start. So somebody else had stepped in to lead worship, but it meant that there weren't any words on the screen, but that really did not hinder our praise and our worship. It was just a beautiful reminder that God longs to hear our praises to him, that he longs for us to enter into worship and focus our eyes upon him. And it was just a timely reminder that our hearts do need to be awakened and aligned to his, because he's got such a deep love for us. And his desire is for us to grow in depth and intimacy and personal relationship with him. And there really is something wonderful, isn't there, about worshipping in song. And over the last few days, it has been such a privilege to worship with others from different churches. And just to hear the sound of praises being lifted up to heaven. Now, we were only about 60 in number, sort of 40-ish this morning. But I'm sure Hazel, you'll agree what a sound it was as we all worshipped together. Just beautiful, just people with a true, genuine heart for worship. Worshipping in different languages, different tongues, just people singing out their own songs. Got this quote from C.S. Lewis, because we each need to respond in worship. And C.S. Lewis said, If all experienced God in the same way and returned him an identical worship, the song of the church triumphant would have no sympathy. Mm. It would be played like an orchestra in which all instruments play the same notes. Mm. Now we were created to worship and we've been called to be worshippers. Not worshippers that have got a divided heart, 
or worshippers with similar priorities, but we've been called to be true, authentic worshippers, worshipping him who gave all and won the victory for us. Because what has our heart is what we will pursue. And worship is ultimately an attitude of the heart. Jesus is deserving of our affection and our responses. And we need to bow down in worship. We need to come. And as we do, we need to acknowledge our own weaknesses. Because our response to corporate worship as we gather here on Sunday isn't determined by the number of musicians present, whether it's a song that we like, whether it's our favourite worship leader that week, but our worship needs to be deliberate, intentional and genuine. Because worship stretches far beyond these couple of hours on a Sunday morning. Because how we serve, how we give, how we love, they're all expressions of our worship. So I wonder, and I do ask myself this question as well, what is our heart's desire as we come to worship? I think it was on the Wednesday evening, we were singing over in Utrecht this week, the, the song with the line, I will give you all my worship, I will give you all my praise. You alone I long to worship, you alone are worthy of my praise. And personally, I felt really challenged by that word all. Really tiny word, but massive, isn't it? And I found myself actually saying sorry for those times recently, but it hasn't actually been all of my worship that I've given. And it hasn't been all of my praise because there's been other things that have crept in and begun to take priority. Yeah. And it is so important, isn't it, that we're checking our own hearts and realigning our gaze with Jesus' gaze. Because it's really easy to sing the songs and sing the words that appear on the screen. Sometimes actually with little awareness of what we're actually singing and the power and the magnitude of that. It's got to that time of year at school. It's nativity time. I have to say we actually start practicing in September. And I've stayed quite a few nativities over the years. And quite honestly, you have to laugh because otherwise you would cry. They're always highly entertaining. And sometimes the children really have no idea what they're actually singing or saying. And sometimes lines just come out without any comprehension of what it is. My particular favourites from this year have been The wise men brought a gift of mould. No, no, they brought gold. I've also this year had See him lying on the bedroom floor. You know, that bed of straw. And then I think my favourite one from this year has been Baby Jesus is nearly two. No, no, Baby Jesus is nearly due. Now, Every year, there's always a line that gives a giggle. And I do find myself saying the same thing of, whilst you're on stage, you're, you're grown up, so I want to see you enjoying yourself. Or, it's a bit more exciting when you say your line. It's usually on those lines like, behold, I bring you good news. I want to express, you know, this is really good news. You get a little bit more excited. I find my voice getting higher and higher and more shrill. But hopefully, by Christmas, we'll have it sorted. But we do laugh about it. But actually, there are times, aren't there, when we don't convey that sense of excitement about all that Jesus has done for us. We don't convey that passion and that commitment through our worship. So are we simply just singing the lines without comprehending actually what we're singing and the magnitude of what we're singing about? Are we singing about rejoicing and celebrating? Are standing there with our arms folded, looking miserable? Or are we conveying our passion and our love for Jesus in all that we're doing? Now, I worked with somebody last year who was a very devoted Harry Styles fan. Now, she was fresh out of sixth form, far, far younger than I am. And she despaired at me when the words came out of my mouth of, Who's Harry Styles? What does he sing? And she was completely devoted to him. She was counting down the days to go to this concert. She'd travel all over the place, working out her outfit, something to do with sunglasses, Harry Styles, I don't know. I was looking for Sophie, which is not here. Risa, do you know? <laughs> but, you know, she would be shouting and singing. She'd come into work then the next day with no voice left because she was so excited to see him. I actually couldn't comprehend this, couldn't understand it at all. All this effort, 
for him. Despite the fact that he could offer her absolutely nothing in return, never going to support her, support her, know her name, be there in times of suffering, or actually offer her anything. But yet we've got a personal relationship, we've got the opportunity to have one with the one who does all of that for us. Now she was known amongst the staff as a devoted follower of Harry Styles. They got me thinking, are we known as devoted followers of Jesus Christ? Are we known as worshippers? Or do the people around us even know that we're a Christian, that we come here together to worship on a Sunday? Because is our lifestyle that of a worshipper the rest of the week through? Another thing I know nothing at all about, but football stadiums and rugby grounds are filled with people getting excited and cheering for their team. And their enthusiasm and their passion comes through in their actions, their words, and their responses. And as we live a life of worship, there should be that real sense of excitement, that sense of expectancy about how God is going to move, and what's going to happen when we worship. Because we need to live and worship in full appreciation of all that God has done for us, and all that he continues to do. But our worship needs to come from the heart, because nothing is hidden to him. We sing that song, don't we? You, our hearts are open, nothing here is hidden. But I wonder, are our hearts filled with pride, anger, resentment? Or are we coming and are we humbling ourselves as we enter his presence in worship? And there will be times when we find it really difficult to worship. But ultimately, our worship isn't about whether we feel like it, whether we like the songs in church that week. It's our wholehearted response to all that God has done. And we need to choose to worship. Shall we read these together? Shout with joy to the Lord. Worship the Lord Verse 4 then goes on to say, Enter into the thanksgiving. So I wonder as we come, are we filled with that joy? Are we worshipping with gladness? Are we bringing our thanksgiving? For me personally, I've been really challenged about what I'm bringing to worship and how I'm coming, how I'm preparing myself. Because we need to come with a sense of humility, bringing everything before the Lord. Because as Jesus is exalt exalted, other things then are reduced. Now recently, there's been quite a few different pressures from different areas of life and Quite honestly, I haven't always felt ready to worship. I haven't necessarily wanted to sing out in praise. But those different pressures will come. They will come and distract our focus, take our attention, get our concentration. But our response to worship isn't dependent upon our feelings, but on our faith, upon what Jesus has done and what he's promised. And the enemy wants us to be disillusioned and he'll take great joy in when we don't push into worship. He'll take great joy when we don't give God our best, when we don't listen to his voice and receive all that he has for us. And maybe you're feeling a little bit like that this morning, that your affection has dimmed, your love has cooled, or perhaps your worship is lifeless. But God wants us to bring our joys, our sorrows, our successes, our struggles. He wants it all to be brought to him. And as we worship, we move away from ourselves and we focus on him. And when Jesus was tempted by the devil in the wilderness, Jesus refused to worship Satan and replied with, the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Referenced earlier in um, Deuteronomy where the Israelites were being brought into the promised land. Because in those difficult seasons, worship can seem harder. But what is our prayer? 
Are we coming and laying our worries and our challenges before the Lord? Are we really pushing in and pursuing a lifestyle of worship, even though things are tough and things are weighing us down? Are we using worship as a weapon to stand against the enemy and to stand strong in our faith? Worship needs to be that declaration of our faith, not a depiction of our own feelings. So when things are difficult, do we wallow or do we worship? Do we pity or do we praise? Because if we don't choose to worship, then we're actually choosing not to worship. Because when we fail to worship God, we'll just end up substituting worship to him for something else, or someone else, or even ourselves. So are we really stepping into his presence, or do we find ourselves stepping away from his presence? So we know the Father is seeking worshippers, John 4, 23 to 24. But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. But God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship him in We see uh, again in Romans 12 where Paul says, uh, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. We're instructed, aren't we, not to copy the behaviours and the customs of the world, but to let God transform us into a new person, changing the way that we think. And then we will learn to know God's perfect will for us, which is good, pleasing, perfect. Because as we come in praise and worship, we will draw closer to him, have a greater sense of who he is as Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And that is so key that we are led by the Holy Spirit in our worship. Because it's only by God's grace, and his kindness and his sacrifice that we're able to have that personal relationship with him. So as we enter into worship with the King of Kings, is Jesus truly being glorified in our worship? One of the verses that I started the year with was this verse in Psalm 105, 4. Search for the Lord and for his strength. Continually seek him. And that for me has just been something I've been coming back to over the last 11 months. But our worship needs to impact all that we are and every single aspect of our lives. We need to be surrendering everything to God. Because when we worship, we're declaring that he's in a position of authority. He is our king of kings and lord of lords. But are our lives under his leadership? And is it all parts of our lives? We can come into his presence to worship and be transformed in his presence. Because worship has got the power to change us. God moves, strongholds break, circumstances altering, lives being changed. So are we choosing that lifestyle of worship? Or are we choosing that lifestyle that bends to our culture and actually ultimately ends up worshipping the things of the world? Because worship is a lifestyle of bringing pleasure to God through the way that we live. And we are only just scratching the surface as we worship here on earth. I've been drawn to Revelation recently with that reminder that we will be entering an eternity of worship when we reach heaven. There's that line in the song, um, for endless days we will sing your praise. Because when God is fully revealed, creation's natural response will be to worship. So I'd encourage you today, I won't read it now, but take some time to read through Revelation 4 and 5. Let's to see what an amazing and beautiful picture of worship in heaven is given there. It talked of the one sitting on the throne who was as brilliant as gemstones. The glow of emerald circles his throne like a rainbow. From the throne came flashes of lightning and the rumble of thunder. I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne and of the living beings and the elders. And they sang in a mighty chorus, worthy is the lamb who was slaughtered 
to receive power and riches and wisdom, strength, honour, glory and blessing. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea. And they sang blessing and honour, glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living beings said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped the Lamb. Do take some time today, this week, to read through that. I actually can't comprehend that wonderful sound of worship that is described there. But thousands and millions of angels, every creature in heaven, earth, under the sea and in the sea. There's going to be no holding back. No reservations, but in fact, just that genuine outpouring of worship to the king. Now, too often we're very reserved, aren't we? Whenever you go on an aeroplane with Hazel, you well, I was very brave because Hazel said, you, you have to be first with the king. I was and I didn't cue politely like Brits do. Um, but actually, we are so reserved sometimes, aren't we? And we are reserved quite often with our sound worship. And perhaps that's a reluctance. Maybe a worry of what somebody else might think. Or maybe we are just too British and too reserved. Perhaps our concentration is elsewhere. What we're having for lunch later. The list of chores that need to be done. The things that are happening this week. But all of those things mean that we're not giving of our all in worship. Now we only need to look at the church at Laodicea to see Jesus' thoughts on being lukewarm. Because he's pretty clear about this in Revelation. I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have everything I want, I don't need a thing. And you don't realise that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. Now this wasn't a church that was suffering persecution or a church with issues of immorality or anything, but it was just a church that was known as being lukewarm. Because they were self-sufficient, they were arrogant, they didn't really notice that Jesus was missing because they've become apathetic about spiritual things. <coughs> and it's easy, isn't it, to become complacent, to become apathetic. So let's just renew that commitment in worship this morning. Because does our lifestyle, Monday to Saturday, match up with who we are and how we worship on a Sunday? Does that worship really permeate throughout our whole week? Because the church there in Laodicea we're a church full of consumers. And are we guilty of coming sometimes and being consumers in our approach to worship? Or are we fully committing ourselves to a lifestyle of worship, no matter what the circumstances? And we read similar in um, Matthew 15, 8 to 9. These people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. <laughs> One of the speakers over in Utrecht was talking about just our commitment, what it means to belong to the church. And he reminded us of the need to share our time, our talents and our treasures. And as we commit to a life of worship, are we giving of those three T's? Our time, our talents and our treasures. Or are we a little bit more reserved in what we offer? because we don't really want to relinquish all of it. We do still want to hold on to some time, some talents, some treasures. But our lives are designed to worship our Saviour, and we need to be truly giving all that we have in love, dedication and adoration, because we have a King who gave everything for us. So as we come now, we, we sing, we bring our worship to the Lord this morning. Let's ponder on what we've heard. Maybe there are things that you need to bring before the Lord this morning. It's things I need to bring, things I need to lay down. Maybe this morning is a time to take a bold step of faith. To step out in confidence and to worship freely in the remembrance of all that God has done for us.
So shall we stand? Shall we worship and bring our praises to him? Because the worship team aren't here to give a performance this morning. We are all here to worship. We're here to enter into that place of intimacy, that place of personal relationship. So let's sing out this morning. Let's praise. Let's have genuine appreciation. Let's bring our own songs, our own prayers, our own offerings. And let's just delight in being in the presence of our creator. And may this morning be a sweet sound to him in heaven as we sit here on earth. 